change it here. Okay. So I am Karthik Gururaj, and uh, what I'm going to uh, uh, start is uh, you know uh, uh, with a sort of a small intro on the company uh, I work uh, in, and maybe what is the session about, uh, right? So that's that's, uh, and then we'll move to the actual uh, technical content, and uh, hopefully a, a short small demo as well. Uh, let's see if we can uh, you know uh, do that. So, yeah, this will be the outline. Uh, so, uh, uh, briefly, who 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 are we as a, as a company? Who am I uh, as as your presenter for now for today? Uh, the title, the topic uh, is on digital twin. So, we'll try to define this in more detail and uh, why this is interesting for you know users uh, and uh, also. What does it mean to work on this as a as an engineer, right? As a, as an engineer, not as a user, but but as an engineer, if you are working on this, uh, what does it mean? Uh, how interesting is it? What kind of knowledge do you need to learn? And uh, maybe a short demo. Uh, so I see, you know, uh, uh, very different uh, 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 folks with very different background having registered for this session. So I thought I'll just mention uh, at least to whom is this targeted for. Uh, so if you're a student uh, uh, who is uh, you know maybe in the final semester uh, looking for uh, career options in core companies, right? Core companies in the sense those that are uh, you know if you're from CS or E background and if you're looking to understand the uh, uh, companies that work on uh, uh, more core embedded systems or you know electronics right so or computer systems as well so i think uh, this is a topic that you should uh, try to uh, get into uh, digital trend and uh, you know, because i think it's, it's it is interesting uh, very interesting and uh, has a lot of uh, growth options as well uh, if you are already an engineer uh, uh, in this embedded firmware software domain uh, and you understand, uh, you know, things like, let's say, device drivers or uh, a boot, uh, boot, uh, you know, um, uh, boot code, for instance, etc. Uh, right? You understand this pretty well, and you're looking for, well, what next for you? What next for me? Right? Then I think this again uh, is a session that uh, should be, you should find to find interesting. Um, couple of points, uh, you know. Uh, we do expect more folks to join. Um, so as is the case with a slightly large audience, um, it's good to have a single uh, presenter, single person talking. So please be on mute. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, uh, feel free to send it on chat and uh, we will uh, pick it up uh, uh, most likely towards the end of the session. So the session itself will not take too long. Maybe uh, I'm looking at maybe uh, about half an hour, uh, not more than that, and then uh, we will have we, we will have some time for uh, going through the questions that you've asked, and uh, I will try and try to address them as uh, best as I can. Okay, so um, let me start with uh, a short intro on uh, on the company uh, I work in. So this was uh, founded. Uh, nearly 16 years back in uh, uh, 2006, uh, right? So um, uh, it is headquartered in Belgaum, um, and uh, we do have a development uh, center in Bangalore. Uh, it is close to Infantry Road for those who have joined us today from Bangalore. We do have, uh, I mean, in this post COVID, uh, post-pandemic era, we do have people working all over India. Uh, we have, uh, you know, folks, uh, employees in Hyderabad, in uh, Tiruvannantapuram, in uh, Salem, in uh, uh, Gurgaon, Noida, uh, Delhi. So uh, we do have uh, folks uh, kind of distributed, but in terms of offices, uh, we have it in Belcom and Bangalore. We have a lot of expertise on uh, embedded software and uh, 
you know, what I'm calling it as model development. And what is this model? What are these models? What do they do? We'll get into shortly. We're about 130 uh, engineers. Most of the company is actually the technical, uh, uh, tech, you know, the, the engineers form uh, the bulk of the company, right? So, so maybe uh, it's a slightly difficult and strange name. So I thought I'll just explain what is in the name. Why, what does this name mean? So um, the company started in Belgaum, which is uh, basically Northwest of Bangalore, uh, right? The, the capital. And uh, uh, so that uh, uh, the name Viavia signifies the Northwestern direction. And it also communicates the, you know, that we are from uh, the, the, the Indian roots, right? So uh, that's, uh, that's what it uh, means. So um, yeah, this is how you pronounce it. Uh, Viavia or Viavia, I think we, we pronounce it Viavia. Um, the short comic I found, uh, any of you, at least uh, those uh, of uh, a certain age, maybe may have been brought up in, on these comics. Uh, if you can guess the publisher, it's very easy actually, you can send it out on chat. So this is a duel between Indra and Arjuna. Uh, you can read up the story later. But in this, you know, a short uh, story, what happens is uh, uh, Indra uh, uh, gets uh, defeated by, you know, uh, Arjuna uh, having yielded the Vyavya weapon. So yeah, it it also stands for a certain, you know, uh, a strength in uh, as well. So I thought I'll just mention it. Okay, so. Uh, that said, uh, let me now talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, we are into different verticals, uh, automotive, uh, communications connectivity, like for instance, 5G or even you know, uh, other uh, kinds of uh, connectivity. Uh, we are pretty uh, strong on the semiconductor uh, EDA ESL. Uh, so EDA ESL stands for electronic design automation or electronic system level design, right? So um, the, dis the topic of digital twin actually does come under ESL and consumer electronic uh, equipments like you know phones or um, televisions, for example. Uh, we do have significant strength on automotive. Automotive today is probably, I think, the uh, growing very fast uh, and probably has uh, a lot more software than many of us know. So automotive has been uh, called as a data center on these, for example. So um, one of the uh, areas where uh, this technology as digital twin is actually picking up very rapidly is an automotive today. Okay, so, um, you know, what sets, sets us as a company apart, right? So we have a, uh, we are 16 year old company, but we do still have a, uh, a, a startup culture. Um, you will see uh, very less uh, hierarchy. Uh, uh, you know, you will directly work with uh, very senior folks. Uh, for instance, that's 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 the uh, philosophy philosophy that we have and the culture that we have. Um, we've been around for a pretty long time, and I think we understand uh, you know how how this whole technology works. Uh, we are very technology driven. So what, what, I, what do I mean by that, right? So for instance, it manifests in many, many forms and, you know, uh, uh, one being we uh, believe in uh, uh, being hands-on as uh, we grow up the ladder. Okay, so we don't, for instance, have a, uh, a culture of pure management, uh, right? So. Uh, for instance, I uh, uh, you know I still do uh, hands-on code, uh, whereas uh, you know in other companies it may not be may not be so. You are encouraged to uh, move to a more management ladder. Here, while that happens, you still remain a hands-on engineer. Uh, we uh, we do a lot of participation in uh, industry forums. Um, so, uh, SM uh, and Accelera are two forums that we participate in. 
we have a lot of uh, uh, we have a patent portfolio uh, you know uh, on in this technology on digital twins and also uh, others so uh, i would say we are uh, quite uh, uh, fond of uh, we are very, very geeky and nerdy that way okay. and uh, there's a lot of opportunity to grow in both uh, you know technical and non technical domain and i think it's a good place a great place to start uh, your career uh, in a digital twin so uh, let me uh, do a very quick intro on uh, who i am i uh, you know your presenter for today and uh, i don't have any content on the slide uh, so again i'm karthik gururaj for those of you who joined late uh, i have about 22 years of uh, industry experience i graduated in 2000 from uh, it kharagpur and uh, uh, i was in uh, philip semiconductors or nxp semiconductors for about 8 years and after that i joined vivia and i have been with vivia for nearly 13 14 years now um i have been involved in this uh, technology of simulation virtual platform digital twin for well almost the entire 22 years uh, plus a few more the things i have i have, I have uh, been, had an opportunity to do um so on a personal front uh, i'm uh, based in bangalore um uh, i was actually born brought up in chennai and uh, i'm uh, i've been in bangalore now for more than 30 years i think so uh i think that's uh, about me uh let's now uh dive into the actual content the meat of the presentation right so we're going to start off with a, a quick intro on what is digital twin we'll try to define this and uh, we will go into why is this interesting who are the users right uh, it is important to know that obviously you know if you if you were to try and predict you know is this technology that uh, is on a growth path uh, then you have to understand why you know why is this why is this of interest right so that's that's the first part of the presentation uh, i think we will have time for a sh very short demo uh, uh, you know uh, after that uh, we'll we'll kind of get into questions okay so uh digital twin right it's it's not a it's not a, a very new term it has been around for uh, a while so if you look at uh, nasa for instance uh, they define a digital twin as a uh, a, a model as of something physical right uh, it's a uh, the, the digital twin can be a physical model as well uh, in their definition uh, so uh, it mirrors the life of its corresponding flying twin right so the digital twin is uh, maybe on earth uh, and it's a mirror of uh, maybe a, a, a rocket that's uh, or a or a rover that's uh, elsewhere right so that's that's nasa's definition so uh and again i think you ask uh, others you'll get different variants of uh, of this term what uh, we are going with here is that it's it's basically a digital representation of a physical of a system a physical system that you can maybe touch and feel right um and for a certain intended purpose it can replace the physical system now obviously a model doesn't can't replace a physical system otherwise it replaces in all cases then it is same as a physical system right so uh however for a certain purpose for a sort of use case it can replace the physical system so what do i mean by that uh no models are again nothing uh, uh new uh, we 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 make uh, we look at models uh maybe right from a kid who is you know trying to create a, you know playing with a play doh you know trying to create we models of uh, uh, some building right uh, right from there to maybe uh, uh, true architecture models that uh, we build uh, maybe of uh, again bridges and other artifacts to kind of uh, see you know to kind of visualize you know how the design will come up uh, so models are nothing new uh, they've been here they've been with us for a very long time um specifically today what i'm talking about is Uh, a model of a uh, electronic uh, controller uh, electronic device right so uh, 
uh, or what we can also call as an ECU. So we are talking about writing a model of that for uh, meeting certain purpose, right? So that's, uh, that's, that, that is digital twin. So let me go to the next slide, which tries to uh, depict this uh, in a little bit uh, more uh, pictorially, right? So if you look at uh, this uh, bottom right, uh, bottom left box, it's showing what is called a virtual uh, ECU. So uh, uh, ECU is a, uh, like a control unit, electronic control unit. So it's a term coming from automotive, uh, but uh, you'll find equivalence in you know many uh, all all verticals obviously. So if you kind of uh, zoom into the uh, electronics of your car, for example, you're going to find it's it's basically a interconnected network of many different ECUs. So you may have a ECU for uh, uh, maybe braking. I mean, uh, well, ECUs are again. Uh, grouped into something called, uh, let's say, domain controllers. Uh, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, let's just assume that uh, you have an ECU for maybe fuel injection, another ECU for um, braking, for example, right? So take take any any use case. Uh, let's say uh, your car has got, uh, uh, you know, ABS, which prevents the car from skidding, right? If when a human driver is, uh, when a human driver is, let's say, uh, um, in a sort of a, a stressful situation, they tend to slam the brakes. And uh, this may cause the wheels to lock up. And uh, once that happens, the car uh, may skid. And once the car starts to skid, uh, you no longer have control of uh, the car in terms of wanting it to go in a certain direction. So um, uh, what the system does is uh, even if the human applies brakes, uh, you know, uh, like pumps it fully, uh, ABS basically releases it uh, so that uh, enough so that uh, traction is obtained. So the wheels are in touch with the, uh, in contact with the ground and are uh, not skidding. And uh, it helps in getting the vehicle to a safe spot. So that's basically the purpose of ABS, right? Now, how this is achieved is essentially there is a, there can, there's an ECU that is monitoring your uh, uh, rotational sort of uh, velocity of the wheel. And I mean, I'm just giving one implementation, probably it can be done in many ways, but well, one implementation is to uh, look at the sort of uh, rotational, uh, you know, uh, uh, speed of uh, the wheel versus uh, maybe the, uh, you know, uh, actual speed of the car. And if, if you compare this, you can figure out if it is skidding or not. And if yes, you kind of release the brake. Right? This is what happens in the ECU. Now, the way it works is it's going to have a bunch of sensors and actuators connected to it. And there's also going to be software that is uh, running in order to decide you know, how much uh, the brake has to be engaged and disengaged and so on. So the point of me explaining all this is to tell you that uh, this is one feature in a modern car. If you take uh, you know, the car in its entirety, it's, uh, it's, it's going to have a uh, uh, tens of ECUs, maybe touching even hundreds of ECUs in some cases, all connected, interconnected in a complex system, and each one having a, a task to perform, right? Now, what we are doing here is we have a, a virtual uh, simulation of the ECU running maybe on your computer, on your uh, maybe a laptop, or, a, or, a power, or maybe a more powerful server on the cloud, right? And you can, on this virtual ECU, uh, what can you do? Uh, as I said, the digital twin is a model of the physical system for a certain purpose. So what is the purpose here? The purpose is to be able to develop and test the complete software that is going to run on the physical system. So be able to do it without really having um, access to the physical system, right? So that's the that's purpose of this digital twin that we are talking about today. We also call it a virtual platform uh, or a digital twin. So, in, at least in the in context of today's this this this, this session, I'm treating these two as uh, as more or less equivalent. Right. And what you can see here is that uh, the, the 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 twin uh, has uh, models of 
all the uh, peripherals, all the devices inside the ECU, all the buses, the memories, and the, the, the control uh, processor as well, right? So all of that is there uh, inside this virtual platform. So this should tell you that you can actually bring up, you know, if you're, if you're uh, familiar with uh, embedded software, you would know that there is a sort of a stack uh, with the device driver layer. Maybe there are uh, middleware, which is, uh, you know, required for controlling IOs like ECIE or Ethernet. And then there are applications on top. There's, of, of course, an operating system. And this entire software is going to be compiled for a certain architecture, like uh, maybe ARM or a RISC-V or a x86, right? So uh, to be able to take the software that has been compiled for ARM and be able to run it on your laptop, which is maybe a x86 machine. So that is the power that virtual platforms uh, give us. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, 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 there are hybrids also possible. So I will not really go into this a uh, lot, but uh, you can imagine, you know, hybrids where part of this is virtual and the other part is uh, maybe not virtual and they are still interoperating uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a certain way, right? So that's also possible. And there are many different kinds of, uh, you know, other simulations uh, that uh, is typically done. Uh, but again, I think we will not really be touching uh, a lot on these things today. So our focus is the column on the on the left. Okay, so just to emphasize this message a little bit more, I have a few more slides to help you, you know, grasp what does it mean for a software developer. So if you look at uh, the as the title says, this is like traditional software development, right? So uh, if you need to develop and test software, and maybe some of you as hobby projects may have worked on, you know, uh, Raspberry Pi or uh, other hobby boards, right? So what you do is you have a, a board, you write software uh, for, uh, you know, targeting that particular architecture, and you flash it or you download it in some way uh, onto the hardware, right? And then, uh, and you run it. And when you run it, the hardware is going to interact with uh, all the IOs it's got, uh, uh, interfaces it's got, maybe some Ethernet, some GPIOs, SPI, I squared C, CAN, you know, so on and so forth. It can also interact with uh, maybe some tools. Uh, of course, physically, there'll be some interface like Ethernet or JTAG, and uh, you can connect tools to the hard hardware uh, so that you can maybe debug software, you can look at some uh, performance metrics, right? All of this is possible, right? So this is with real hardware. Now, with a with a virtual ECU or a virtual simulation, uh, it more or less is the same behavior, okay? So you still have uh, the software that you need to run. So uh, yeah, again, you should remember that the virtual ECU is also software, but it's actually a simulator software. This executes the actual target software, right? So the target software can be your, uh, maybe a, 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 some, some application, some software that, for example, if you go back to the ABS use case, maybe it is a software that's intended to run on this ECU for uh, doing ABS, right? So that, that is a platform software. The virtual ECU is also software, but that is software that's modeling or mimicking the hardware, right? So this is going to mimic your uh, ABS uh, ECU, right? So this uh, can, um, you know, just like you flash the image, you download the image onto a hardware, you can similarly uh, provide the image to your simulator. It can run it, it can connect to debuggers. You can, you know, you can attach uh, profilers, you can attach other interfaces, just like a real ECU will. There are some differences, but uh, they're, I would say they're not really significant, you know, in the, in, uh, in understanding what this technology can provide because the differences you can always, uh, you know, work it out, right? Uh, so that's always possible. So uh, this is essentially what, uh, you know, virtual platforms allow, allow you to do. 
and uh, uh, so i think uh, you may say all all you know all good but so what you know why do i care i mean i have the board so why will i use this uh, i i don't really understand right so that could be one response uh, that will try and address soon uh, or you can ask okay i accept maybe this someone has a use for this but uh, but so what i mean i am not user it may be uh, used by some 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 people uh, elsewhere so why should i be interested in this as a technology right so again that's another question we will also try to address uh, very soon okay so yeah it's identical software as is going to run on your real hardware you can connect uh, the simulation to you know tools like debuggers profilers and also you can connect it to you know uh, what is going to exist outside the ecu like you can connect it to some sort of a model of a sensor uh, or maybe even a real sensor so that's all all that is possible okay one point i should emphasize here is that a virtual platform is actually easier for software developers to uh, you know who wish to uh, debug the software because it's it's all a simulation right you can uh, you can stop when things go wrong and you can go deep figure out what is going on and then you can you know try and fix it with real hardware it is it is actually harder uh, uh, you know the visibility that you get is uh, much less okay so again this slide is about uh, you know why uh, or specifically on the benefits uh, let's say we understand what virtual platform is but uh, we need to ask okay so so what does it really enable us to do, right so for this we have to go a little bit more on the uh, how products get developed because this is not uh, the, the the answer that we are trying to uh, the question we are trying to answer here is not purely a technical question it's about the value of uh this is a technology and that's really a uh you know a question uh, uh you know uh, for which we have to leave technology aside uh, and and step out a bit right so if you look at how um one might develop uh you know a product so you have uh, what is called a hardware development and a software development phase right so what does that mean uh, it means that uh, Uh, a team inside a company is going to uh, decide you know the architecture of the ecu let's say uh, what processor what peripherals maybe how much of memory etc 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 and uh, that development starts so the hardware development has its own life cycle it goes through uh, like like a front end and a back end phase if you want to divide it at a very high level front end includes what is called an rtl model and then uh, well finally the thing is you know some some time later you i mean towards the end you are going to uh, send a uh, a file uh, called gds2 to a fab and you're going to get back uh, after some time you're going to get back uh, maybe a test strip or maybe an assembled uh, board a test board right a physical prototype so this is the life cycle of the hardware itself in between there are going to be uh, prototypes on maybe fpgas for example uh, where uh, you know you, you you can try and uh, check you know uh, the development until that point in time you know you can try to verify that uh, that's that's a physical prototype right so if you look at the software development uh, well uh, you need something to test and execute the software right so if you're relying on physical prototypes then you're going to start the software development uh, somewhat later in fact much later right and if if you're purely relying on physical prototypes it so happens that uh, uh, the number of amount of software uh, uh, in terms of uh, the engineering effort right uh, far dominates the hardware development even though this diagram i'm showing both to be like a same length uh, if you look at it from effort point of view software is much uh, more uh, effort intensive the number of uh, folks in the software team is much larger and if you you know again this is not uncommon uh, that the software engineers have to share the 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 boards the prototypes is not very uncommon uh, you know that 
when when I was uh, uh, you know in NXP, uh, we had what are called emulators. Uh, these are very expensive prototype machines, and you'll get some slots like one hour slot. Sometimes at very odd hours, right? Two a.m., three a.m. So you log in. You have to use that slot to do whatever you can, and then well, that's it. And then you get the next slot maybe after a few days. So in the in in between, you will try to analyze you know what has gone wrong, and try to improve your software, right? So uh, these prototypes are basically a scarce resource, and people have to share it, right? So. And also physical prototypes tend to fail easily. There can be a capacitor or some component that uh, you know goes faulty, and then you know it's it's number of uh, boards reduce even further, right? So that's all these issues are there. Uh, there are design issues, by the way, between hardware and software, and you tend to identify this much later if you follow this cycle. Because what if the software team comes back and says, oh, okay, I didn't really mean this. I wanted the hardware to be done this way, right? You find this as a problem much later in your uh, cycle. So hardware software issues, HSI uh, interface issues are discovered much later. And all of this basically means that when you finally have to launch the product, the system testing phase has got a very high risk, okay? So again, this may sound boring, uh, may or may not sound boring. I don't know, but uh, at least you know this. This information uh, uh, is very important, uh, right? Uh, you know, in terms of trying to understand where the uh, inefficiencies are in the process, uh, and once we understand that, we can see clearly what does the digital twin as a technology basically brings in, right? So let's move to that now. So what does it mean to work with, uh, you know? Uh, uh, virtual platforms or digital trend. How does it accelerate this entire development cycle, right? So, uh, uh, you know, comparing with the, uh, you know, the flow on top, of course, you have to invest in writing the platform. I mean, you as in the company, you know, whoever uh, uh, wants to, uh, whoever is developing this product, they have to invest in, uh, in developing the models. But the good thing is once that is done, Software development can start immediately uh, in parallel to the hardware development, right? So uh, this is very good because uh, uh, it's, it's it's also you know possible to share this with how many other people you want because all this are this is just a simulation. It's just a program running somewhere, right? You can easily scale it up. And uh, again, in today's post-pandemic world, where many many folks are distributed uh, sometimes across geographies, right? Uh, it is far easy to connect them to a simulation model than to ship them a physical prototype, a uh, physical board, right? Uh, that's uh, maybe not possible in some cases. And some of you may be uh, aware there is a sort of a ongoing component shortage, right? It's, it's uh, sometimes uh, everything is fine, but the lead time for just getting all the components you need to assemble the board is like uh, one year or more. So, um, which again, is not a problem if you're talking about a virtual platform, right? And uh, the the best thing I would say is that all the interface issues are identified upfront, right? So uh, you tend to uh, fix this much uh, sooner. So there is this sort of a, uh, I would say almost a law, right? Uh, when it comes to how products are designed, that a bug that is found um, early gets fixed at a fraction of a cost than a bug that's found much later. I mean, it sounds obvious, but if you think about it, uh, it will it will really uh, uh, you know help you understand you know why it's so important to find these issues uh, early, right? So. Uh, that's that's basically uh, it's it's like you know as if uh, let's say you're going to a shop to buy something right but you you forgot to maybe pick enough money so maybe if you realized it when you're at home it doesn't cost you anything if you realized it only when you went down and you started the vehicle then yes you need to put it off come back pick the money and go back it costs you time right and obviously much worse if you realized it only when you went to the shop. Right, so the entire trip is gone, right? And uh, maybe not an issue with today's digital payments, but that's not uh, you know uh, my point here. 
So uh, that's the, you know, the, the technology really uh, allows you to identify these issues much early. So that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. And uh, all of this basically means that you can enter uh, in the system testing phase with a lot of confidence, uh, you know, and uh, you, can, uh, you can basically cut down what is called TTM or time to market by a significant factor, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, again, I should emphasize, you know, when it comes to system testing, uh, when you're putting two and two together and hoping it works, it helps a lot if one of these two is uh, tested and you have some confidence. If you're trying to put something together and you have no idea when things don't work, you don't have no idea where the fault is, where the problem is, you tend to lose a lot of time. So with virtual platforms, software tends to be a little bit more mature, not a well, lot more mature. Uh, and, uh, and it helps a lot during system testing phase and quickly identifying the issues, okay? Now, TTM uh, is a pretty important factor. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I will maybe uh, uh, not really talk about it here, uh, but maybe briefly, right? If, if a company has a certain uh, window for launching a product, right? Maybe for instance, uh, it, uh, the, some, in some cases, you know, um, there, are, there are some natural uh, events that occur, like maybe there is a Christmas, or Diwali sale, right? And uh, it's possible that a company has to launch a product on that in that window. If it misses it, then well, Diwali only comes after one year, right? So, uh, so it's very important to be able to uh, predictably complete all of this within a certain window, right? And uh, virtual platforms or digital twin is uh, uh, an excellent tool uh, in order to, 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 to do that, okay? So uh, who, okay, all this sounds good, but is it really being used? Uh, and if you recollect what I said, I said, um, like I've been more or less my entire career on virtual platforms and this is like 22 years I'm talking about. So you may very well ask, you know, uh, so why don't I hear about this? Are uh, people using it? The answer is yes. Uh, there are uh, a lot of companies that uh, uh, do use virtual platforms. Uh, you know, a significant uh, part of the development is based on virtual platforms. This uh, shows, the slide shows, uh, we have tried to categorize it in several ways. So you have people who develop tools around uh, this as a technology, digital twin as a technology. You have folks who provide uh, like a service, like YVL apps, for instance. You have semiconductor vendors who uh, are uh, going to also develop models and use it as well for developing uh, the, for instance, the device drivers and operating systems. Then there are tier ones and OEMs. Uh, the OEMs are the names we all recognize, right? Who, who also, uh, uh, you know, do this, uh, use this as a technology a lot, right? And this list, by the way, is a very small list. It's not uh, exhaustive. There are many more companies that uh, use the, uh, the technology. So, uh, okay, so that is on the user side. Now here, most likely you are here today, uh, you know, to understand what does it mean for you as a career option, right? What does it mean for you as a, engineer working on this why would you be uh, why should you be interested right so i would say uh, you know uh, what we have looked at so far is in bottom part you know this is a technology that's very much in demand uh, so uh, uh, that's that's one answer to the question right so this is uh, something that uh, uh, you know you will C has value uh, with uh, across the industry, right? Now that's one answer to the question, but the other answer is coming from, you know, what does it mean? Uh, if there's some typo here, you will gain an appreciation of uh, system architecture, uh, right? If, if you're someone, if you're anyone who finds uh, hardware interesting, uh, you know, if, if you are into tinkering, if you would like to, if you would like to understand, you know, how this whole, how does this whole thing work? Uh, what, what, what does it mean to say it's a 
PCIe interface or Ethernet or you know how do timers work, how does interrupt controller work, and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, uh, well, digital twins, uh, you know, gives you a sort of a, uh, well, I wouldn't say even ringside view. This is you're like in the game, right? You're you're actually uh, you're going to model your entire hardware, so you're going to get a very deep uh, understanding of uh, how systems work. Uh, so that's one part. And other part is a lot of this development is done in C++. Now C++ actually happens to be, I, I would claim that it is probably the most uh, complex uh, uh, and popular language uh, today. So other languages like uh, maybe Python or you know, uh, even uh, you know, uh, JavaScript and et cetera, et cetera. Of course, they have their uh, niche, they have their domains. But just purely in terms of the language complexity, I would say actually C++ is very complex. Now that may not necessarily be a, be a positive thing, uh, but uh, it so happens that C++ is also the choice uh, for many large software projects, uh, complex software projects. And uh, learning C++ uh, is going to help you uh, as a software engineer, uh, right? So, uh, and this as a technology requires you to understand C++ and uh, OOPS uh, in depth. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that I would say is a, you know, another uh, reason why you as an engineer should be interested, right? So you're going to straddle the sort of uh, uh, bridge between hardware and software uh, in this uh, whole technology. Okay, so um, I think we do have time for a short uh, demo. But uh, for those of you who maybe are tuned in in between, you know, if you have any questions, any any comments, uh, feel free to uh, type it out on chat. So let me switch over and see if I can bring up something. Uh... Okay, I hope you can see my uh, 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 terminal. So it so happens that I'm actually running a virtual machine. So this is a Oracle uh, virtual box, uh, which maybe you're familiar. You know, you can you can boot uh, like Linux on Windows, right? Uh, you can do that. So that is also a kind of a virtual machine. But today, what I'm going to do is in that virtual machine, I'm going to start another VM. So this is like. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Inception, right? It's, it's a little bit like that. So uh, uh, what are we trying to do here, right? So let me try to show you the command I'm running. I'm going to use uh, what is called QMO, uh, uh, Kimu, some people call it Kimu, some say QMO, right? Uh, QMO is an open source uh, emulator that can, uh, uh, that can be used for full system simulation, right? So uh, today I'm going to show you how uh, a board called versatile board, ARM versatile board. So you can just search. Uh, this is like a, you'll find the details of what is there in a versatile board, right? So we are going to basically uh, boot the versatile TV board with a cross compiled, uh, you know, uh, with Linux cross compiled for ARM. So that's what we are going to do. So you'll see here, I'm providing it a, a file called uh, QCOW2. So this is actually just a regular file on my uh, on my uh, machine here. Now this is going to function as a hard disk for the virtual uh, you know image uh, for the virtual boot. Okay. So let's see uh, how this goes. Okay. So sorry. Try to pull this down. So this is uh, just uh, Linux uh, booting up. So let's uh, give it some time.
So okay, as it's going on, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, QMO is not uh, developed in C++. So we actually use uh, a, a different uh, library called System C, which is based on C++. And uh, but what it can do, you know, with System C and QMO uh, are um, uh, somewhat uh, equivalent. Uh, uh, so I thought I'll just use QMO as a demo for today. So again, this terminal itself, right? This is also uh, maybe uh, something uh, interesting here. What you see is when you when you are booting on a board, what you will have to do is you will have to connect uh, the serial interface of the board to maybe your computer, your host, your laptop. Um, so there are maybe you'll use an adapter like a FTPI, you know, a USB to serial adapter, for example, right? And then you will connect it to your laptop. And on your laptop, you will start, uh, you know, some sort of a uh, console uh, that will connect to uh, the serial interface, right? And when you do that, and when you um, start the uh, start the uh, boot the uh, board, then you are going to see these messages streaming, you know, uh, through the serial line. Uh, you know, you'll kind of get it on your window in your computer, right? So that's that's the basic uh, behavior. Now here, that's that is not really what is happening here, uh, but something very similar. So it so happens this QMO simulation actually has a, um, a sort of a serial model, a UART model, and that uh, is then uh, connected to this window that you see uh, on my screen. So it appears for a user, it appears like as if I have a board connected to my host. Uh, right, uh, uh, and that is booting, right? That's how it looks like. But uh, this this whole thing is just running as a simulation here, as a program. So what you see is that I've got a, uh, I don't, I hope it is clear enough for you. Uh, so I got a terminal, so I can log in now, right? So you can see that uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, it's a versatile, uh, you know, you can see it here. Uh, okay, not able to highlight it. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you can see that it is a, uh, the kernel is compiled for versatile and uh, the architecture is a ARM V5, right? Uh, so that's what you see. So my host is an x86 uh, machine, but I'm now booting the complete uh, Linux image of a, uh, of for an arm on, on my host. So you can, for instance, check proc uh, CPU info, right? And you can see that it says, uh, what it says here, it's the arm 926. Uh, yeah, and it's a versatile PB board. Um, you can see that uh, the memory uh, right, it's, it says that it's got total memory of around 128 uh, MB. Uh, so my my uh, virtual board has uh, configured, uh, you know, I've configured a memory of around 128 MB. So that's what you see here, right? So I have a full system. I can I can develop test my software here without actually having a real board uh, with me. So it's it's almost uh, uh, near uh, real time. Uh, it may not always be so, but uh, in most cases uh, the speed is uh, quite uh, manageable for a software developer. Um, so I think that's that's all I have. Uh, I don't think uh, there's anything a lot more I can show you here. Uh, so. Um, Maybe, you know, I can, uh, we have still a few minutes of the session remaining. Uh, are there any questions? So I think uh, I'm going to request uh, uh, Parul, uh, who's, the, who's the host for the session. No, uh, I think I'm forwarding you some questions. You know. Okay, sure.
Okay. So let me just read out uh, uh, a question. Uh, when uh, it is said that the virtual model replaces something, is it only during development or an end product? Uh, so that's the first question. So uh, this is only, of course, during the development. I mean, you can um, write a model of a, maybe a simulation of a form, but uh, you can even maybe place calls through it. But obviously, you, you can't carry your like laptop and go with you whenever you want to do, uh, do uh, a phone call, right? So this is, this is uh, the model is created for a certain purpose. And it's no different from, you know, you walk into uh, uh, maybe an architect's office or maybe you walk, let's say you want to buy a home, right? You're going to uh, uh, go and see maybe a model of the apartment, uh, for instance, right? It is there for a purpose to kind of easily visualize uh, some uh, uh, some information, but of course, finally, you need the real real thing. Uh, the The whole purpose of this is to make the development of the real thing, uh, whether it's a phone or a software that runs on the ECU. Uh, the purpose of the model is to make that the process of developing that uh, simpler, uh, better in some ways. Right, so. That was the first question. Uh, then, um, uh, okay, I think uh, the second question doesn't apply because uh, I think follow up only if uh, it replaces the end product. Uh, then there's a question on whether QMO is developed in C. Yes, QMO is basically uh, uh, mostly developed. I mean, not mostly. It is it is uh, developed in C. It doesn't use C plus plus. However, if you kind of dig inside. You will see that they have borrowed some concepts from C plus plus. Like they have uh, like a way to uh, they have like a class like uh, concept. It has a constructor, uh, destructor. You know um, that uh, you can do. So um, uh, QMO is actually a very interesting. I, I, I personally find it very interesting. Uh, it's, it was uh, it started by a, a developer called Fabrice uh, Bellard who has done a lot of other things, very cool things. So you should uh, maybe look it up. Uh, so yeah, QMO is developed in C. So um, there's a question whether Digital Twin, is, is it more of a software-based simulator or a software-based emulator? And uh, also another question whether emulator and uh, Digital Twin, is it the same uh, in context, right? So, uh, uh, well, I think the word, um, the terminologies have seen it being used uh, slightly differently by different people. So let's uh, let's try to uh, set some uh, you know uh, context here. So when you hear uh, folks from let's say uh, uh, pre-silicon verification, right? You talk to someone who's doing work on system very log, uh, etc. When they talk of emulators, they basically are talking about what are called in circuit emulation, ICE, right? Uh, not in internal combustion engine, but uh, yeah, in circuit emulators. These are um, very expensive. You can think of these as very expensive uh, custom uh, servers, right? Machines uh, that uh, companies like Synopsys or Cadence or Mentor Graphics, they, they, have, uh, they all have uh, 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 products in the space. So let's say I am a, a part of, let's say, Infineon or NXT, and uh, I have uh, defined my har hardware architecture, platform architecture, but I want to actually test it, right? Now, it is not efficient if I get my board uh, and then I test and I find issues and then I have to go for a, what is called a new respin, then that will mean one more board and so on and so forth. So it'll be nice if I can test it uh, in some other way. So I would go to these companies and get their in-circuit emulator, which are like big boxes, big machines, and uh, again, pretty expensive. And uh, then you can, you know, uh, uh, you can actually uh, uh, do a lot of uh, verification on these emulators. So that's one use case uh, and one use of the word emulator, okay, in-circuit emulator. But emulator in terms of, uh, you know, QMO, for instance, uh, it's quick emulator. It is, uh, it is emulating a, a an architecture 
as as another software program so i would just for sake of clarity i would actually call it a simulator and try and differentiate these two as two different things right even though uh, well again some people do call it emulator you, you might have even heard of uh, uh, dos box emulators you know if you want to if you want want to run old games uh, right on your new laptops pcs you have emulators that emulate uh, you know these these machines so these these are those are also called emulators but just for sake, sake of you know distinguishing these two approaches maybe i would i would prefer to call that as simulator instead okay so uh then there's a question are, are we going to run klm model of a twin on kmo well uh it's not uh impossible to do that uh, right but uh, um but that is not i mean you can do that but that is probably not what you want to do now kmo itself is a model uh, or a simulation of a hardware right so um what uh, uh, you would that when you talk of a tlm model uh, you would either use kmo or i would say you would use system c that the, i think the name tlm uh, i mean you you really probably it really mean uh, in context of system c here right so uh, uh, i would say you know you, you would uh, either have kmo or uh, system c you're not going to try and get system c on kmo uh so that i don't think is really a use case we probably are looking at uh is it mandatory to have a good hardware knowledge to start start system model uh to some extent yes at least i would say um well to start i would say at least a desire to learn hardware knowledge is uh, uh required you should be comfortable um uh, you know going through technical reference manuals and uh you know you should have a appreciation of uh, um things like what 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 does an interrupt mean now how how is the interrupt actually routed on a on a real platform right so it there's a hierarchy there as well uh, for instance a peripheral like a uart may send an interrupt that will go to a interrupt controller which will then forward it to the maybe a um a controller i mean um uh, core like a arm for instance right you have to understand these details to some extent or at least be obviously willing to dig and understand the uh again concepts like dma uh, cache etc etc i think it's i think it's good to have uh, an appreciation of this and uh, so that's that really sets uh, the modeling a little bit apart from maybe other regular software uh, development if you are you are you are developing software but you are trying to model hardware so you should uh you should uh, be comfortable uh with that as a domain as well then um there is a question on whether uh, is docker used for this virtual models in any way if yes uh, how was the digital twin how is this different from you know docker as a paradigm now uh uh i would take a step back uh, and you know actually show you that uh, what what i showed you here uh during the demo i'm actually running it on a virtual box okay a virtual box is a virtual machine a vm that's running on my laptop which is boot which has booted windows right now uh, a virtual uh, box is uh, still pretty different from uh, what i am referring to as a digital twin because a virtual box is only going to help you boot a, a, a linux on windows for the same architecture okay so uh, i can't using virtual box uh, or uh, uh, you know or, or vmware or you know uh, uh, which is meant for uh, os uh, level virtualization i can't uh, boot a linux compiled for arm i can't boot it on an x86 machine right so that is not possible so that is one uh, that's what virtual boxes and uh, uh, what, what that's what oracle virtual box allows now a docker is actually a more lightweight than even virtual box uh, right it's uh, uh, so it is it is not going to help you um, if you are go going to have uh, 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 an image uh, a software that has been cross compiled for a very different architecture so what i want you to imagine uh, if i were to 
take an example. Let's say you want to develop some software that is supposed to run on Raspberry Pi, right? But for some reason, you do not have a Raspberry Pi, right? Now, how will you test it? So you can't use Docker for that, okay? So you need a simulator or a, a, a Raspberry Pi simulator, uh, you know, you, you need that, right? So that's what you need. So that's basically what I'm talking about here, okay? So Docker is more uh, a container for uh, applications that help you maybe uh, cleanly separate, uh, you know, and package, uh, you know, uh, stuff. But it is not going to help you um, target software for a completely different architecture, right? So that's uh, that. I would say is a is a big difference. Um, if you are familiar with Android uh, SDK, uh, right? Android SDK, you know, actually has uh, uh, you know you, you can actually has phone um, a sort of a model, so you can uh, develop. Um, Android software uh, like applications and test it on a phone uh, that is part of the Android SDK, right? And uh, you can even do things like, I mean, you can see how the application comes up, you can interact with the application uh, and test it and so on and so forth. Now it so happens that Android SDK actually uses QMO at the behind the scenes to orchestrate this whole thing, okay? So that's how it works finally uh, in case of Android SDK. So QMO basically does help you in uh, simulating a completely different architecture uh, on, uh, you know, uh, it helps you simulate architecture X on architecture Y, right? So that's that's what QMO allows, to, uh, allows you to do. And same is the case with uh, Digital Twin. I'm talking about QMO because it's open source. It's easy for you to go check it out and uh, experiment a lot with it. But uh, when I talked about uh, most of the uh, slide, where, when I said, uh, you know, digital twins and so on. Uh, uh, you know, there are more commercial offerings that are, uh, I would say, different from KMU and maybe better than KMU in some ways, right? Uh, so that's that's what companies are using. Uh, so that is around something called System C, so which is also happens to be open source, uh, and you can um, uh, look it up, and it is based on C++. Okay. Okay, so uh, I hope I've been able to address um, most of the questions. If there are any follow-ups, you know, feel free to drop a message.